Hi, I'm Ahmed Tabedin, and you're in the stream. Today, we look at the deadly impact of Cyclone Ide in Mozambique. Then we'll look into what we can learn from MySpace's loss of millions of songs, photos, and videos, and what it suggests about our tendency to rely on the internet to store our most treasured memories. But first, as millions of people are getting ready to vote in Thailand's first election since a military coup in 2014, we explore the high stakes and possible outcomes. Remember, you can always leave your comments in the YouTube chat as we look at this clip from Al Jazeera's Scott Heidler in Bangkok. For decades, Thailand's youth has been politically active, like in this parade held before the annual rival football match between Thailand's top two universities. It satirizes politics here, and one of this year's targets, the general election to be held Sunday. Many taking part have become old enough to vote since the last election eight years ago. And with nearly seven million voting for the first time, a forum was held in Bangkok to teach them how the process works and why it's important for Thailand. We want a free and fair election, not, um, not just an election that legitimate someone that to say that, okay, I become a government because I'm elected. I think it doesn't matter which way we go, what matters is what people believe in, democracy or dictatorship. For more on this, I'm joined from Bangkok by Pravit Rojanaprook. He's a senior journalist at Khao Sad English. Uh, Pravit, thank you so much for being with us. I want to start with the basics. I mean, thank what you. makes this a very different election from those in the past? Well, for a few reasons. Obviously, as pointed out, um, it's been um, nearly five years since the military have staged a coup and ruled Thailand uh, as a military dictatorship. So this will come uh, as a, a time when uh, the people will get a chance to decide and um, 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 determine the, the faith of the future of Thai politics. Secondly, actually, this is the first time in eight years that uh, Thais will get a chance to vote and uh, nearly 7 million out of um, um, 51 eligible voters will be voting for the first time. And on top of that, um, you have uh, the junta leader, uh, General Prayut Janosha, running as a uh, candidate um, to become prime minister of Thailand again. And um, Pravit, yeah, we can go on and talk I mean, we, about... We yes. will go on, and what I want to go on with is, is some of the concerns of the voters. Obviously, there are many concerns. A lot of people online mm -hmm. chiming in, telling us what they are more, more concerned about. Mm -hmm. Sunai, for example, right. on Twitter saying, breaking Human Rights Watch, saying that Ch Thailand's junta has created conditions that obstruct free and fair elections. People's mm -hmm. right to choose their government are severely undermined. Do you agree with that statement? And what do you make of all the concerns of, of this election essentially being rigged and not being a fair election? Well, as I was just about to point out, um, there will be 500 um, um, lower house or member of parliament elected on Sunday. And on top of that, um, another 250 will be selected and basically appointed by the junta leader, who is Prayut. And Prayut was the junta leader and the coup leader, and who has appoint, made himself prime minister over the past uh, near five years, is competing as a prime ministerial candidate again. And this 250 people that's going to be appointed by Prayut will take part in the vote that would select the next prime minister. So one third of the vote basically has already been secured by Prayut. So this is well, I mean, that doesn't an sound, uneven. That doesn't sound very mm -hmm. fair. Does it sound fair to you? Uh, well, I think to say that it's not fair is an understatement. Um, it's a lopsided um, um, election because one candidate already have basically, you know, the power to appoint mm -hmm. people who will vote for him. You know, one third of the people, which is 250 out of 750 um, 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 people, if you combine both upper and lower houses. And, and, you know, for those who don't know the intricate details mm. of the Constitution itself or even the history of Thailand, I think what will really, right. you know, resonate is a, a clip that we have 
which really illustrates mm -hmm. how young people are testing the limits not only of speech laws, but really pushing the boundaries mm -hmm. of political discussion. Uh, and it seems they have mm -hmm. a growing audience. Take a look. The public is starting to listen, thanks to bands like Rap Against Dictatorship. Their anthem condemning corruption, political impunity and a growing social divide went viral with close to 60 million views. The rap troupe believe their song's popularity is the only reason they aren't in jail. Political discussion is good and it should be free. No one should fear being arrested or getting thrown into jail for talking about politics. Private, your reaction, I mean, obviously we know that video went viral. Do you think that's why they haven't been arrested? You know, we know many others who have spoken out in similar ways have been arrested. What do you think this means for the youth vote? It means the youth feel that they have not been listened to and they want to have a role in shaping the future course of Thailand, and rightly so. And... Um, and uh, the online um, public sphere uh, is growing. The internet has become a new public sphere that will, that enables um, um, Thais, mostly young, a lot of them young Thais, to deliberate, converse, and even add the uh, anti-junta sentiment as you have uh, shown, you know, Ahmed, the, mm -hmm. the fact that we have seen this um, wrapped against dictatorship videos going viral um, with nearly 60 million voters, I mean, 60 million viewers, while, you know, the Thai population is just south of um, 70 million. So, Praveen, it what, means... Yeah, go on. Yeah. I was just going to say, whatever happens, well, I'm curious, because a lot of people, you know, commentary, you know, varies on this issue, but mm -hmm. you keep coming back to this fundamental fact that the military is going to be in charge ultimately, regardless of what happens. Is that true, do you think? Um, uh, yes and no. no. There's still some possibility that the so-called pro-democracy slash um, anti-junta camp could master, it, um, say, 376 votes or slightly more out of 700 votes. That's going to be very difficult, but it's still mathematically a possibility. Or if the pro junta parties gains very few lower house votes then when they would need to enlist the support of the senate which will be appointed by Priyut, uh they will definitely not have the same um, level of mandate or legitimacy so it's still not a done deal first of all secondly even if Priyut wins he will not have absolute power as he used to mm -hmm. um, as a junta leader, so he will become an elected prime minister. But um, at the same time, we also have to deal with the, uh, the armed forces, particularly the army, which behave as if it is a state within a state and they have a strong pension for staging coup d'etat. So the current army chief has refused to mm -hmm. commit himself publicly well, uh, um, in not staging and, a coup. For and example. perhaps that's not surprising, but only time will tell ultimately, Pravid. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us here at the stream. Thank you. Now, shifting gears, a look at the deadly cyclone that has completely devastated swaths of southeastern Africa. Mozambique has borne the brunt of storm a day with hundreds of people feared dead. The port city of Beira has been virtually destroyed by floodwaters. Al Jazeera's Malcolm Webb filed this report from Esponga Beira. When ferocious winds ripped the roof off Tariro Sitole's house, she was terrified. She ran outside into the torrential rain with her children just before it collapsed. We were very afraid. We were panicking, but there was nothing else to do except move outside. Now I have nothing. I don't even have money to build a new house or rent somewhere. She's among dozens of families who are now sheltering in schools here in the town of Espungabera in Mozambique. They've been homeless since Cyclone Idai swept across the country after reaching Mozambique's coast on Thursday. Many villages are now completely cut off. 
Al Jazeera's Malcolm Webb has been covering the aftermath of the cyclone in Mozambique. He joins us from the city of Chimoyo. And in Geneva, we have Matthew Cochran. He's a spokesperson for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Gentlemen, uh, thank you for being with us. I want to start by asking you, Malcolm, where are the aid efforts? I mean, how would you categorize this, given all you, you've been witnessing on the ground there? Sorry, the line was a bit out there. Please, please say that again. I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, where are the aid efforts now in terms of being able to provide the, the immediate aid that people who are victims of this uh, are, are in need of? Well, I'm sure Matthew would be able to, to tell us a, a bit more about the specifics, but certainly what we've seen in, uh, in the western part of the country, people have received almost no help at all. Uh, I mean, that's not surprising, given that most of the roads have been cut off. Uh, and also towards the coast in the flat plains, towards the coastal areas, that's where people have been stranded, people stuck in trees, stuck on the roofs of houses. Uh, so I understand that what little resources there have been have been focused on rescuing uh, those people who are stranded first. Mm -hmm. uh, but we travelled yesterday by road from Espongabera, where you saw the report from to Chimoya, where we are now, through some of the central region and saw some very hard hit areas where people have lost their houses, their huts, just fields after fields of crops completely obliterated uh, by the wind and by the rain and by flash flooding, flash flooding from, uh, from the rivers. Uh, and definitely those people right now and then for, for months or maybe even a year ahead, there's going to be a, you know, a very serious food problem uh, in, in very many areas, even in the highland areas where they didn't suffer flooding, field after field of crops completely destroyed. And very many of the people here are subsistence farmers. Right. Uh, so, of course, this is their food supply for the year ahead that, that, you know, that's been destroyed in the fields there. Of course, and Matthew, uh, you know, hearing uh, Malcolm outline some of those issues, I can only think of, you know, the waterborne diseases and all the kind of protracted issues that then emerge uh, in the next, you know, few months and years. Obviously, you're familiar with, with kind of the scale of the devastation, but for our, our viewers who may not be, I want to share this tweet from Dipti Bhatnagar. The day the sea came into the land and destroyed everything in its path, it really just gives you a sense, just one week difference, you can see all this area here, all I just zoomed in there for you, all that black, just to really give you a sense of how much destruction uh, was on the ground. I'm curious, though, Matthew, I mean, what would you say is the most urgent need right now? Yeah, um, well, I mean, the, the most urgent need right now is, is search and rescue, is saving lives. There's still many thousands of people on rooftops or on hillsides or even in trees, um, and, and the priority, I think, for, for many organisations on the ground, you know, led by the government, is to is to get those people to safety. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking to a colleague earlier today, there's a sense that perhaps and hopefully some water is the water is beginning to recede, and it's not raining at the moment, or it certainly wasn't when when we were speaking. So, hopefully, that means that uh, that that uh, the search and rescue efforts become a little less urgent, and uh, the focus can turn to. Um, providing the humanitarian assistance that, that is desperately needed. As Malcolm said, there are countless communities that, that haven't been reached. In terms of the scale, I, I mean, I don't know if this is useful. It certainly was for me, but I had a colleague explain to me today that the, the amount of the, the area flooded is is roughly equivalent to the size of, of the state of Rhode Island. It's a, it's a huge area. It's almost like the ocean, like the earth was tipped and the ocean poured into Mozambique. And, and you know, there was a period there where entire areas were under metres of water where there was no distinguishable landscape. It was, it was simply just water as far as and, I could say. And, and Matthew, you know, as you're outlining that and making that comparison for American viewers who know the size of Rhode Island, I mean, that is huge. I mean, it's a, it's a huge uh, area of land. But for those who aren't familiar, this, tw this tweet that just came in or a comment on YouTube, Maynard Singh, Speaking to exactly what you're talking about, saying, I don't think it has gotten the level of response a disaster should get. Though India sent some humanitarian aid, some big steps need to be taken to prevent more destruction. Would you agree with that assessment, just given your experience in general in this field? Yeah, completely, completely. Again, I mean, I, a couple of days ago, there was a sense that the world hadn't really woken up to what had happened. You know, that, that for whatever reason, um, no one had really anticipated how big this disaster was going to be. And, and in fairness, the, the, the disaster is, is complicated because it's, it's, we're also speaking about flooding that pre-existed the cyclone and with it, we're speaking mm -hmm. about highly vulnerable communities that mm -hmm. perhaps people weren't really aware of. Um, but it's probably, 
Well, I think now, I mean, let's be positive. It's now, yeah. now I think we can say that the world does realize, but that, yeah. that realization has to be followed by action, right? Of course. And, and, you know, talking about action or the lack thereof, I know that Malcolm, obviously you're there on the ground and, and, you know, having covered some natural disasters myself, I remember Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Sometimes you come across things that just jar you, that strike you, that move you, that surprise you, that shock you. Is there anything you can share with us that you've you've experienced on the ground covering this that, that you think is important for people to know? I guess the first thing that for me that was very striking was the cyclone itself. We were due to fly into Beira the day before it uh, was originally due to hit. That was last Friday. Uh, but then the cyclone was coming in from the Indian Ocean quicker than uh, had originally been expected. So it actually came in on Thursday evening. So all the flights on Thursday were cancelled. So we tried to get in via uh, Harare, the capital of neighbouring Zimbabwe instead, and then driving from there. So it was when we were around the border that the, the cyclone hit. Very strong winds, really strong, much stronger than a, you know, than a normal in uh, in those areas, and then followed by torrential rain, uh, more rain than uh, and I've ever seen, more rain than you could imagine. It just pretty much doesn't stop for four days. Mm -hmm. and so, of course, all the drains fill up, the rivers fill up, just water everywhere. It's mm -hmm. almost impossible to stay dry in a car, in a house. Uh, and then, of course, the vulnerability of those communities, as you just mentioned, I mean, Hundreds of thousands of uh, right. people are affected are living in very simple structures made of mm -hmm. you know, bricks made of earth, iron sheets on the roof, many of them in huts. So, of course, a few days of rain makes them very weak, strong winds, uh, you know, very easily knocked down. So it's a completely different picture to what you'd get if right. you had the same and storm. Right. And in North America, where, you know, where all the buildings are right. concrete. Most definitely. And that's, that's an important point to raise. But, you know, I also want to share with our audience a clip which really demonstrates not just in Mozambique, but the challenges that these type of countries, to your point, as compared with Western com countries, or I should say a country like America, you know, what they struggle with when they try to alleviate the, the most extreme eff effects, let's say, of, of severe weather. It's in Zimbabwe, which was also, of course, badly hit by Cyclone Ide. Take a look at this. Rescuing people when there is bad weather can be extremely difficult. It means the helicopters can't take off. And some of these people have been waiting for days to hear news about their loved ones. They don't know whether they are alive or dead. Cyclone Idai is the worst storm to hit Zimbabwe since Cyclone Eli nearly 20 years ago. Some Zimbabweans say government officials should have reacted faster and learned from past natural disasters. We have uh, existing structures uh, that give us an indication that people were prepared. But the magnitude of what happened now was unimaginable. Uh, uh, and we will learn uh, as, as we go forward. I think that's an important point to end on uh, right there. Malcolm Matthew, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us and for all your work. Now a trip down memory lane. A one-time social media giant is back in the headlines this week, but sadly for all the wrong reasons. MySpace confirmed that it has lost all content uploaded to the site before 2016. So yes, that's millions of songs, videos, and photos that have been forever deleted. MySpace says the data was lost during a server migration that went wrong. Now, the Beverly Hills headquartered company was once the most visited site in the United States, but has long since been surpassed, of course, by Facebook and, well, most other social platforms that we all use. The huge deletion of user data has raised questions, however, of how far companies can be trusted to manage the kind of content that is often deeply personal, to say the very least. Joining us now to discuss all this from Beacon, New York, is Jason Scott. He's an archivist and a technology historian and is the creator of textfiles.com, which archives files from bulletin board system. Um, Jason. So many questions yes. for you, but what does this actually mean? I mean, I personally know what it means because it means I can't access songs that I made when I was 17 that I'll never be able to make again because for reasons that don't matter to anybody watching this program. But what does it mean to you? What, what does this mean for all of us? I get, I, it gets pretty deep, actually, because we as people create things, we collaborate, we have discussions, we get involved with each other you know, not just creating, say, songs or, or sharing things that we found online, but we actually, like, you know, put our own history in. It's where we know what we are. And sometime between the late 1990s and mid-2000s, we start to see companies offering us platforms to do that. And mm -hmm. now we just think of it as social media. Mm -hmm. But what it really is, is we just told companies take everything we create directly from our phones and our minds and store them for us, and we'll all work out what we do next 
later. Yeah. And later is starting to show up now. That later is, is um, the problem, right? I mean, so, so, yeah. so what can you tell us when it's later than the later that we're in now? What can we do to protect and, you know, these precious memories and all this history you're talking about? I think the fundamental thing to understand is that there was a business model decision made in the late 90s that the way to grow the internet was to give everybody uh, free access. Like we want to adopt cars, give everybody a car. This is actually what we did with credit cards in America. We just gave away credit cards with no restrictions just to get it off the ground. And now we're at a point that people are going, what's this free thing I have? And also some people are saying, well, of course, it's always going to be free. And that's when you start to have the scandals with advertisers and tracking because mm -hmm. somebody's got to pay for it. Well, I think what's going to happen is that people need to realize that these phones and, and desktops they're using to save their memories, they're ending up on places automatically and they aren't being asked mm -hmm. to get it back out again or to understand or for people to understand where their materials are sitting. And I think that it's time just you got to take some level of awareness and responsibility. You know, it's like it's like places like Facebook and Google, they're like electricity. You don't think about them until things brown out or flicker. And I'd say it's probably a good idea to start assessing how much of your, you know, really family history and personal creation is what I'm worried about. Your own music, your family's lore, your history, you and your aunt who you never talked so, to talked on Facebook. Yeah. I always talk to my aunt, but the point is, the, the point is, um, we have a lot of people concerned now, obviously, about the platforms that they currently care about, right? Whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like we all have a preferential platform. And, uh, you know, we look at Reclusive Busybody, which is a very compelling Twitter name in of itself, on Twitter saying, it's sad that a lot of artists lose their work or lost their work, I should say, but on a personal level, I don't remember my password for it, and I've wanted to delete my account for a long time. It finally happened, but at a cost to everyone else, so I'm okay with it, but sad to those who lost their work. Uh, so a little bit of compassion there and empathy, but obviously not a fan of MySpace. Do you think this is inevitable for other platforms, for Twitter, I Instagram, do. Facebook? No, no, I absolutely do. I, I, in this particular case, we have a really egregious, just complete lack of doing the right thing for a company of this sort of stature and, and material. But other companies will make this decision, but they'll make it logically or monetarily. Uh, YouTube deleted thousands of annotated uh, or, or annotations on videos, citing that it was a low uh, traffic, low audience feature. But it was a feature that had tens of thousands of videos that were using it. They just decided it was too small for them, mm -hmm. and years of that went away. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the decisions. It's not just you know think of it as the difference between a, a forest fire mm -hmm. and a controlled forest fire. It's <laughs> it's still pretty bad. Right, and I think there's maybe no real point of comparison there. I want to ask you, Andrew Mark Sewell on Twitter said, "Call me old-fashioned, but this is why I always have a physical backup of all my data. Don't trust the cloud." I feel, you know, that's noble and perhaps what some people do, but it's definitely not what I do. I don't have time for that. I don't think that's practical. Is that the best advice that you could give to anyone, Jason? It's the best goal. The best goal is to realize that the things that the, you know, think of something that you've done, written, taken a photograph of, and think of a world in which that isn't around. For some of your material, you're not going to care. But if you have things that would go even on a USB stick, taking your personal documents folder, your personal photos photo uh, collection, and just putting it on a USB stick in your house, that's one step that you could take, I think, today and save well, it. Well, Jason, uh, Jeremy, I'll leave you with this, uh, tweeted into the show saying, I backed up my Facebook for that reason. Wish I would have been able to save all of my GeoCities pages, which makes me just feel very old because I don't even mm -hmm. know if I remember what GeoCities is. Jason, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us. That's all for today here at the stream, but keep sending us your comments through Twitter, YouTube, and aljazeera.com forward slash the stream. See you soon.